continuing on through this chapter, through this book, and uh, we're here now in chapter 24. We left off in verse 34, and let's just read through the end of the chapter. I mean, hey, let's let's just get it read, let's get it in there, and uh, we'll uh, tarry on and see how far we, or not tarry on, you tarry when you stay, you, we will press on and see how far we get through it, but we'll begin in verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, who his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day, when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us look to our Lord now once again in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. I thank thee, our Father, for the day that you have provided and blessed us with. I thank thee, our Lord, for allowing us the privilege of coming into the house of the Lord, for allowing us the privilege of fellowship and worship and singing and hearing and reading of your word. Thank you, our Father, for each and every one. Genuinely, I thank you, our Lord, for each one that is here. We miss those that are not able to be with us. We do pray for grace and deny and pray thy healing hand to be upon them. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with our church as it's been prayed, that you would lift us up, Lord. Help us to be a lighthouse in this community. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts, ears, and minds to be open and receptive to thy word that... And everything we do, that we bring honor and glory to thy name, that the word of God is being preached in truth, not in the way and in a slide, because it is the tradition of men, but as saith the Lord, and thus saith the Lord. And Father, if we be true to your word, I ask that you would uh, just open our, again, our hearts, ears, and minds, that we would see it, and that you would reveal your truth to us and seal it to our hearts and our minds. Father, keep me strong to your word. Help me not to sway from the true teachings of the word of God and not put a slant on it. I feel a slant should be there. I ask, Father, that you would keep me in your word. As the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God, and I desire to be a servant of yours, rightly dividing the word of truth. Help us, our Lord, to grow, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, first and foremost, that it be thy will that we would grow, even numerically, not just to have numbers, but that people have a genuine longing and desire to hear, thus saith the Lord. Forgive us of our sins. May thy will be done in these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Matthew chapter 24, continuing on, as we go through, we pick right back up here in verse 34. Verily, 
I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. This generation, again then, must be taken literally, literally in the context of what we already know about Matthew chapter 24. Uh, again, the natural and normal meaning of the word in the Bible. We are not going to just now take verse 34 and transplant it back to the destruction in Jerusalem in 70 AD. We are not going to just transpire it to be the current generation in which we are now living. But when we look at Je uh, Je uh, Matthew 24-34, we see the judgment of the great tribulation, the generation that lived in that time will see this come to pass, right? Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So the generation that is living in the time that the great tribulation is to be poured about upon this universe, that generation will be there until all the signs of the Lord's coming come and the Lord comes back and the second phase of his coming. you got to take it within what it says. We can't just extract it and say, well, now this re uh, uh, refers to Jerusalem 70 AD. Well, now this refers to the exact time that the Lord was talking to the disciples, so let's use it for here. Or now it refers to the time in which I, Justin Meyer, am preaching this to you. We've got to take it in the context of the fact that this is during the Great Tribulation, and the Lord is true to his word, and so he says, Verily I say unto you, meaning pay attention, truly I say to you, this generation, the generation that is living through the, gener or through the great tribulation, shall not pass to all these things being fulfilled. Now that generation lives to see the specific signs of the great tribulation and the signs in the heavens. That witness the return of Christ, the setting up of his kingdom. So then, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I want to say clearly, as much as again I, I say we say true to the word, and we don't. We don't go from the word and we take the word. This is not a metaphorical teaching. And it is not that the Lord is contradicting his word in a plurality of other scriptures that I'm going to read to you. I'm going to make you see him with me. We're going to turn to a plurality of scriptures. This is not teaching that heaven and earth shall cease to exist. But as they are changed into something new, this truth again is set forth. In both Testament. Now what this is teaching, and I'm going to backtrack, and then we will go to those scriptures that teach about heaven and earth. But what this is teaching is that the Lord Jesus' words are more reliable than even the strong foundations of the earth and the mighty pillars of heaven. In other words, that... When the Lord spoke here to the disciples that asked the question way back at the beginning of the chapter, right, verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And so, as the disciples heard this teaching, as the multitudes heard this teaching, as the naysayers heard this teaching, it is that the Lord made the strongest possible, of ex uh, possible expression of His divine authority by which He spoke to assure their feeble faith. I don't say that derogatory. We know that the disciples have had a weak faith. We know that they have been wishy-washy. We have seen time and time again that they doubted the miracles of the Lord. Well, not, not necessarily the miracles. They have doubted that the Lord 
When he said that he would die, they doubted that. They'd gone back and forth. They'd come to the script. And so when the Lord says that these are the signs of his coming, he makes them the most assurative and authoritative by all divine power, stating that his words shall not pass away. Beloved, you can believe what God says. You can know when the tremble and the totter shall be no more. The word of Christ shall remain in full force, power, and virtue. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to take you back here in just a few moments about the verses in both the Old and New Testament about heaven and earth. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, speaking about the assurity of God's word, we hear... And see at 1 Peter 1, verses 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of the Lord endureth forever. The Lord Jesus Christ is teaching that with all that is going to go on in earth and all of the shakings of even the heavens, that His words shall not pass away. They are to be trusted. They are sure. Now again, I want to give you a plurality of verses in both the Old and New Testament about heaven and earth. Turn with me, first of all, if you will, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1 and verse 4. In Ecclesiastes 1, 4, it says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. In one day there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. But let me keep taking you through this. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 104. Psalm 104 and verse 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth should not be removed forever. Go to Psalm 102, verse 25 and 26. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment as a vesture. Shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. They will change, but they will be forever. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 6. Isaiah 51 and verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. And look upon the earth beneath, for the heaven shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So there is going to be a change again of heaven and earth. When the Lord says in our text in Matthew 24 that heaven and earth shall pass away. It is the declaration of the fact that there is this Old Testament prophecy that there is going to be this change in heaven and earth as we know it. There is going to be the new heaven and earth that is talked about in the book of Revelation. But let me continue on. Let me bring you over to that in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 18 now. Verse 
For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So they shall pass. One, two more. Second Peter. Chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The Lord is not misspeaking when He spoke in Matthew chapter 24. Yes, heaven and earth as they know it shall pass away. But even in that, His Word shall stand. Now, just so you don't think I'm totally going crazy, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 is all I'll read. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Right? So, everything I've read has been consistent from Old Testament to New. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away... There was no more sea. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, called by the same things. So, when we read Matthew 24 again, and we read the words, that heaven and earth shall pass away, it is not, again, that there is that total, that they're never going to exist again, but they will change. Consistent throughout the Word of God. They will change. And even in that change, the words of the Lord shall not pass away. They are right. They are true. They are steadfast. Again, they remain in full force, power, and virtue. Beloved, I need you to know that God is sovereign. He is in complete control. And His word shall stand. And what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say about His coming is just as true and sure as for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. It's just as true and sure as John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You believe this, then believe John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Those words are true. So with all the change, with all the tribulation, with all of the things that will be coming to pass, God's words are true. We move on now to verse 36 where the Word of God says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Mark records it this way, and I'll just turn there. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32. But of the day of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So, beloved, again, while there are many signs of the Lord's coming, both for the first phase of the Lord's coming at the rapture and of the direct signs that are there as listed out for us during the last three and a half years known as the Great Tribulation, as many signs that there are of the Lord's coming, no one knows the exact time it will occur. occur. Therefore, based upon Scripture, where it says, but of the day... An hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The Lord is confessing there is only one that knows of the exact time of my coming, and it is of the Father only. Then based upon that, it is foolish. It is foolish for us to set up the date and the year of the Lord's return. It dishonors the Word of God and brings reproach upon prophecy. The Word of God is very clear and very concise. 
And again, the words of the Lord shall not pass away. The Lord Jesus, when teaching His disciples about His coming, about the signs of His coming, says, even to them, that no man, not even the Son, knows the time as Mark records. And now understand that Mark was recording as the Lord Jesus as a man and as a servant. Beloved, it is a great mystery how in Christ's divine nature, He could be omnipotent, on, on, omnipotent, and yet in His human mind, limited in knowledge, both being united to one person. That is the mystery of godliness, right? I mean, it is mind-boggling when you think about the fact that Christ is fully God, and then yet as fully man, still being fully God, confesses that no one knows but the Father, and yet He is fully God. That is the mystery of godliness. But I believe it because it is in God's Word. Therefore, that's why I know it is foolish for any of us to try to put a date, a time, and a month upon the return, the second coming of the Lord, both in first and second phase. We know not. We know not. All right. So, Reese, before I read verses 37 through 39 here, I want to say I think it was very wise of you to wear that shirt tonight. I think you are doing a lot of forward thinking as we get into verse 37 through 39 here. Yeah, <laughs> your dad was doing a lot of forward thinking there. All right, let me read these verses, folks. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So understand what this is saying. We're going to go back, we're going to read the text in Genesis that refers to this teaching here that the Lord Jesus Christ probably over 4,000, 5,000 years later, came and, and told the disciples about to look back and think about the time when God judged the earth in the days of Noah, that while Noah, yes, was charged to build an ark, Noah didn't know the exact day that that, way, that that water would come, that that flood would come, that the heavens and the earth would break forth, that water would come from above and come from beneath, and that the flood would come. Noah didn't know the exact day, but Noah went as a preacher of righteousness. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We can understand, we can know, we can see the signs, we can preach about it, but we don't know the exact time. Let's go back and read that reference, folks. In Genesis chapter 6, in Genesis chapter 7, <laughs> Genesis chapter 7, I'm going to take the time, I'm going to read to you the first 16 verses. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For there, or for thee, have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by seven, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters came upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two into Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life. In the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and, all the, and the windows of heaven were open. The rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And the selfsame day under Noah and Shem and Ham and, Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, 
and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into Noah into the ark, two and two, all flesh wherein is the breath of life. They that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, the Lord shut him in. Beloved, as with everything in the Bible, it seems, and especially in Matthew chapter 24, this, this chapter that we are studying, scholars are divided as to whether we ought to apply these words in Matthew 24, 37 through 39 to the rapture, which is the first phase of the second coming of the Lord, or the actual second coming of the Lord at the end of the Great Tribulation. Before I dissect this coming any further, as far as I can tell, they may, they may be justly applied to either phase of the Lord's coming. I don't think we can limit it to one or the other. Because I believe that when Christ returns, most will be unprepared for His coming. As I just said, we now read this is a direct link back to Genesis 7. As I read this, I trust you've been able to see some parallels. And you can link this event to what is going on now. And probably even parallel to both phases of the Lord's second coming. I want you to understand that in the days of Noah, Noah was living in a very corrupt and wicked time. People were rebelling against God. People were blaspheming God. This is only six chapters in from creation. People were blaspheming God. Murder was going on, right? Cain and Abel, and I'm sure others. Disrespect of parents and elders. I don't think it would be too far of a stretch that homosexual activity was going on by what we read of what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 24 about marriage and being given in marriage. All of this was happening in the days before the judgment of God that came upon the earth through this flood. If you're still there in Genesis, it was so bad that God said in Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 through 7, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him and his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God is not admitting mistake. God is not admitting failure. And God is not changing His plans. God is acknowledging that the sin of man was great at this time upon the earth. And God is a God of grace and love and, and salvation. But God is true to His Word and God will pour out judgment as He did even in the days of Noah. Not in the same way as God promised us by the token of a rainbow to never flood the earth again. But in the days of Noah, it was a wicked time. The flood upon this earth was a worldwide event, not just an accident, not just a weather phenomenon by Mother Nature, but out, the outpouring of wrath of God. Man was evil right down to his thoughts. God said He was going to destroy the earth with a flood of water. We could read on, but I want to stay to our text in Matthew 24. We could read on where Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and Noah and his family were going to be saved from the judgment to come. Noah was commanded to build this ark. 
Again, the earth was corrupt, as it says in verse 11. The earth also, chapter 6 in Genesis, the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. With the earth. And He told them to build an ark. He told them the dimensions. And all the while, as Noah was building this ark, he knows that the judgment of the Lord is coming. He knows not the exact... You know, these people that were living there, and I believe Noah was preaching to them, but they didn't know the exact time. Right? How do I know? It says in 2 Peter 2, 5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. It took him many years to build this ark. I believe he warned the people, preached to them for about 120 years, and told them about the judgment that was sure to come. The people did not listen. They were so concerned with just living their life in any old way they wanted to and doing as they pleased. I mean, they'd never even seen rain before. They didn't believe judgment was coming. The Lord referenced this event when He talked about His second coming. We think about the way people live today. So let me set up this typology for you that we are referencing back to in Matthew, or yeah, from Matthew to Genesis. Beloved, in the month and days before the flood, people of the world were just having a big old time, giving a marriage, sodomy, drinking, partying, carrying on, just like we have today. People giving a marriage. Sodomite marriage now legalized in America. Getting drunk. Abortion. Murder of babies. Adultery. Fornication. Pornography. Corrupt politics. People having a big old time. <clears throat> we have preachers today warning people, telling people about the dangers of blaspheming God warning them about judgment to come, and they just don't believe it. They don't want to believe it. I mean, God can change them. You understand that. God is able to make them understand. We can't. We just have to be responsible to preach as Noah did, and teach, witness, live our lives. But the world, by and large, wants nothing to do with God. And then all of a sudden, in the days of Noah, Sudden destruction came. They did not know the exact hour that judgment was coming, and then all of a sudden it came. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. We've read some of this. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, knowing this verse. That there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens... And the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved into the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that the one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Remember, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. And who are we to say how many days have gone by? That one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. 
but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All of the ones, all of God's children, all of those that have been elected before the foundation of the world should come to repentance. And then I read to you earlier verse 10. Again, God is not slack concerning His promise. His judgment will come. Do not know the time, but it will come. Our world today is just like it was, or even worse than in the days of Noah. Verse 39 says, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be doing what they were doing. And they knew not until that flood came. That is, they knew not the exact time until it came upon them. So again, the Lord says, it shall be when the Son of Man shall come. They shall not know the precise time until He comes. Again, we've talked about the comparisons and the typology. Noah knew the flood was coming, and he prepared as God told him to do. Did not know the hour, but he knew it was soon. I mean, imagine 120 years. Faith like Noah. Noah had faith that God was true to his word. As I said, the world around them didn't believe that it would rain as it's never rained before. And they thought, why would it rain now? People of our world do not believe that the second coming of Christ is near. They try to laugh at us, just as they did to Noah in Noah's day. As I said, I'm not going to try to divert too much, but let me say this. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and Noah and his family were shut in safely when the Lord closed that door, when the Lord shut him in, when God shut them in. They were safe in that ark. I want to tell each and every one of us that there is a way to escape the wrath and the judgment of God. And that is salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what the Lord says. The wrath of God will come. The judgment of God will come. People will live through those terrible times that know not the Lord as, Jesus, or as Lord and Savior. those of us that have been saved, let us have faith to know that God is true to His Word. That judgment is coming. And let us tell others. Next week we'll pick up in verse 40. And we'll see here the separation and how it relates and not take it out of this context. I thank you all for your attention to the Word of God. May God use His Word and the blessing to it, convict and teach us. Shall we stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer?